All right, everyone. Well, welcome to this uh, webinar on the speaker series of feminist leaders. And I'm so happy to have with me uh, Alejandra Colom, who I uh, call Ale. And uh, Ale is an amazing educator. She is an anthropologist. She's a scholar. She's a, an advocate. Um, and she's an inspiration really to me on the work that we were able to do together in Guatemala around um, working with indigenous young girls. And I really learned so much from Ale and her uh, in the collaboration that we had. And I thought, what an amazing person to invite and have with us and talk about feminist, feminism and, and her life and what that's reflective in her um, education and her life and her work. So um, today I'm going to have uh, a few questions for Ale and we, and really have a dialogue about feminism and her journey. And uh, hopefully some of you will also have some questions um, uh, as we wrap up our dialogue and you also want to have some interactions. So if you are coming with us from, to join us from anywhere in Latin America and would like to listen to this in Spanish, please feel free to go to the interpretation, uh, the little globe on your screen, um, the lower right side of the screen and hit on um, that icon and hit Spanish and you will be able to hear everything in Spanish. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, all right, we'll go ahead and Ale, uh, welcome, bienvenida. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, and Ale, we, I'm, I'm just so uh, interested in the way you talk about feminism and in your life and your practice. And um, I have a few questions for you today and wanted to start with, uh, learning uh, about your the start of your feminist journey when that was. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this, Vero. I, I have been anticipating this talk for a long time. And I am so thrilled to have um, listeners and viewers from all over the world, places that I visited, places that I've worked. And um, I say that because I there's a deep connection between um, my feminism and seeing the world and and I'll explain why but my I think my first memories of what I la later understood were feminist thoughts uh, started when I was like five years old in kindergarten where when I realized that boys had advantages that girls uh, sometimes were told not to do certain things and to me that seemed absolutely wrong so I have one picture to show you uh, that illustrates a little, little bit uh, how I took on my first feminist fights. And uh, you can see me, um, I'm six. I'm uh, climbing up a river with my cousin. I had to lead. I was the one that was encouraging him to take this risk of just walking up slippery ro rocks. And I, I think I'm probably yelling at my dad or my mom saying, I'm okay, um, not being really sure if I was going to be okay. But uh, my, my first uh, experience or experiences with feminism were exactly that. A lot of scraped knees, a lot of bruises, a lot of uh, scolding from adults saying, um, girls don't do that, girls don't do that, girls don't do that. So uh, when I was five or six, I would pretend I was a boy. I would dress in pants, I liked my hair short because I realized that boys had an advantage and I didn't understand why. And I think that's what made me very angry. And uh, when I was five, I, uh, I thought about my first goal, my life goal would be to fight for boys and girls so that they would have rights, equal rights. And I didn't understood, like I said, of course, I didn't know what the word feminist meant. I, uh, I had just been exposed to certain images, I think, from UNICEF, and that's where I learned that there was this thing called rights. And um, I was five, I remember it very clearly. And by the time I was six, I, was, uh, play, I would play with my friends and my role would always be the boy because the boy had more fun. 
the boy got to go out in adventures. I wanted to see the world and it seemed like all explorers were men. And, and I thought that was very unfair. I wanted to see the world, I wanted to travel. And, and so those goals um, stayed on with me for the rest of my life. And I can say probably those remain my only goals, just equality and um, seeing the world and meeting people. And that's how I became an anthropologist actually. So that was my first, my first feminist memory, it's kindergarten. Thanks so much, uh, Ale. And now I want to um, ask you about the your experience, a reflection on your education and feminism. Is what comes to mind when you uh, think about uh, those two together? Well, um, and I because of my experience, my educational experience. I, um, I think I have this wider view of what a feminist education is like, because I attended Catholic school run by nuns. And usually when I say Catholic school run by nuns, people think oppression and obedience, but I was lucky that I attended a, a school that was run by feminist nuns. Um, this is, some, it's called the Mary Knowles and they're based in New York and these women thought that women should do everything, that they could do everything, that they could travel the world and, and become professionals and that there was no task that women couldn't perform. So I did attend this privileged bubble of uh, encouragement where we were uh, told you can do everything. You want to do sports, do sports. You want to lead the play. You want to write the script to the play you want to go out and volunteer or be an agronomist or be whatever you want. And so again, uh, they never said the word feminist. And, and I want to highlight in that in my story because I am sure that for many uh, of the participants in the panel today, that was true too. They, like you probably grew up feeling there was something wrong with the fact that girls didn't get the same chances as boys, but you didn't learn the word, what the word was feminism until you were much older. So. I went from kindergarten through high school at the school, and I just thought about words like equality and opportunities, and um, and also uh, the right to be angry by the fact that I was no matter how hard I tried, I was still put back in the gender categories and in the sex categories, and be told that I would probably outgrow this re rebellion, this rebellious attitude and that I would eventually just want to settle and get married and maybe have an, a job that would not conflict with my wifely duties. And, and I kept growing, I kept getting older and older and I never uh, came to terms with that. So by the time I was in my twenties, I knew that I was not going to conform with that. And, and that these rules that I had kind of discovered by myself when I was growing up was it were going to stay on with me for the rest of my life and that I did want to learn from other women and work with other women in their own contexts to be able to find a way to exercise their rights and basically arrive at a point in their lives where they would be happy. Thank you, Ale. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, an experience you've had in your work where you felt a realization of your feminist principles? Well, <clears throat> I, want to talk, I want to talk about child marriage because I think um, this is one of the topics that unites many of us around the world. It is a really tough topic because we see it happening in different formats in different ways. And of course, I, I did not, I was never pushed to get married as a child, but, um, or even like a, an adolescent, but in Guatemala it happens, in Central America it happens, and around the world it happens. So I've always been against it, but once I've traveled and worked with colleagues around the world, I see, I have worked with colleagues in Benin, I have, wor I have worked with colleagues in India, et cetera, and my experience listening to them is that we cannot set the same standard for everyone. Of course, we want every girl and adolescent to grow up 
and be over the age of 20 to, to, and to make this decision and make the choice to marry, but the reality is different. And a few years ago, I was working in Guatemala and we were working with indigenous communities and in the poorest communities, girls were getting married at 14, 15. And one of the girl leaders stayed unmarried for a couple of years. And then when she turned 16, she told me, get married. I, I think it's time. And I was very sad for her, but she said to me, you don't realize that I gained two years. Um, I gained two years that allowed me to know my rights. And 16 is pretty old in my community. So um, I learned that we need to be patient in this fight, that, uh, that we cannot just jump and, and fight this battle without understanding the nuances and listening to these girls and how they think they're winning this war. And, and that story came to mind because here I'm here in Honduras right now working with women that have become uh, pretty successful coffee growers and exporters. And two of them were child brides. They got married when they were 16 and they are still married. And, and my bias and my, and, and my prejudice is why? Why are they still married to these men who are like 10, 15 years older? But um, listening to them, I, I remember I need to respect women's journeys and they are happy. And it, I go back to that question, like they have managed to find the way to become fulfilled and happy. And, and they are happy exporting coffee, which is great and working in their farms and they have great gained the freedom that they didn't have as adolescents. So I think the, the this uh, humble reminders that feminism looks differently across the world and that we cannot impose our own agendas without listening to people and understanding people's paths is something that I need to remind myself of daily. And I sometimes think I'm, I'll just tattoo it in my arm every time I want to tell someone what to do. Thank you so much for that, Ali. I think it's um, so uh, great that you talk about this contextualized feminism, the importance of understanding um, the, the context and also where young girls and women are at and how they perceive with their own feminism. What are the successes look like for them? And I really appreciate that um, in your response. Um, I wanna ask you, because obviously there's been influencers and mentors in your life, feminists uh, around you who have had an impact and uh, who are these people? And how have they influenced you? So um, I'm going to go back to my uh, school experience because I think these teachers and the, and the nuns were, were key to my, to my mentorship and education. I, Although I was, uh, I grew up in a household uh, where gender roles were pretty standard, where I was not limited in doing things, but also I was not encouraged to do more as a girl or get involved. It was pretty, let's say, um, normal in the statistical sense. But um, in my school, I had teachers that were breaking these rules. And my first huge mentor was my sixth grade teacher. Um, her name is Claudia, and she had just finished teacher's college. So she was really young. She was maybe 19 or 20. And um, she was my social studies teacher, and that was always my favorite subject. So Claudia, I think, read in me this um, anger, this, this uh, uncomfort. I was so uncomfortable with certain things that... Uh, looking for outlets and and she encouraged me to do basic things like read not take the first the only one uh, opinion as the only opinion to go and inquire more to diversify the sources of my information and to also very importantly just keep going because uh it was not going to be easy if I, if I expected everyone to understand where I was coming from, I should expect people to be puzzled and to try to 
control my life or later I learned tell my parents that they were doing a poor job because I was turning out the way I was turning out which was basically I want to work what I had said when I was five for girls and boys to have equal opportunities and for some reason that seemed to be dangerous once I started to talk about statu quo about power about myths about um once I started speaking up, I think it became uncomfortable for people. So Claudia was my first big mentor. And then um, the sisters in the school uh, where they were very uh, feisty and they, and they liked uh, to encourage us. But one um, sister Katie, who was maybe 80 when I met her, uh, I was volunteering with them at one of the hospitals that they ran. And she said to me, Never forget this story. She said to me, I became a nun because when I was young, the only way to see the world was to be a nun. And the only way to uh, stay unmarried was to uh, become a nun. We've lost um, the connection for a minute. Hopefully um, we knew this was likely to happen uh, from where Alejandra is, but hopefully she will reconnect with us shortly. Um, but I'm really happy to be here with everyone. I see that there's a number of people joining us from um, all over. And again, my name is Veronica Torres and I'm with the Cody Institute. I'm one of the uh, staff here, and I'm really excited to have uh, uh, connected with uh, Ale. And as you can see, she just have a disconnection right now, but she'll be back. Um, and I'm really, it's really great to see everyone's on the chat, letting us know uh, where you're from, where you're connecting from. Um, yes, and we'd love to see some questions if there's any, and we'll keep them um, as a resource when uh, Ali comes back. And we actually just have one more question for Ali, so it will be possible to interact with her soon. Um, so looking forward to your, to your uh, questions and the Q&A. A uh, question about how Alejandra and I met. Um, well, we actually, a number of years ago, I ended up in Guatemala to um, really understand uh, how to improve uh, a program for indigenous girls um, in the Quiche area of Guatemala. And Alejandro was uh, at the time leading the organization that I was supporting um, called the Population Council. So we met there and um, that since then we've stayed in contact. So our uh, lives have turned in many directions and uh, we've reconnected for this. So do let us know if there's other questions. Oh, sorry, I, as I predicted, the internet kicked me out, sorry. I don't know where I left, Vero. I was talking about the non, the 80 year old year old. Yeah, it was great. Thanks so much, Ale. We had um, 
quite a few uh, um, people then just ask a couple questions. One of them was how we met. So I just mm -hmm. filled in with that, which is great. great. Um, but yeah, I thought that uh, I would add one more question before going to the um, participants who have joined us. And that is, can you describe diverse forms of feminism um, that has been dismissed or uh, looked at not, as not good enough in your eyes and, and tell, tell me a little bit about what that has been like. Yes, um, I, I have thought really hard about it because of course we are not free of prejudice. And I, like I said in my previous example, to me, the issue of child marriage or the marriage in general it's, it's a tough one to tackle because I, I respect and I think that women should choose whether to marry or not, whether to stay in a marriage or not. And, but we know also that many of, of the societies where we work, there's very little option. Women still need to get married and come to terms with it and make the best of it. So my, um, one of these, uh, one of the dismissed forms of feminism is that um, that we should fight against ma child marriage, but the, the fight is not the same in every place. And sometimes I have uh, seen and heard feminist colleagues uh, calling for certain actions that are not sustainable. And as much as we would like to just uh, impose our ideas on, on communities, there's the, the time frames and the, and the forms in which child marriage will be eradicated around the world are going to be different. And, and that's hard for me because I live in a country where, where child marriage is still very frequent. And, and, the, and the fights that we engage in need to come with other fights like opportunities for education, for work, but also with a justice system that really protects girls and women. So. So looking at the, at the individual fights and the, at the community level fights of certain women, um, I sometimes uh, become very, very uh, critical because I say, well, this is not enough, but who am I to judge what's enough for people? And, and, and yeah, and, and I see a, a message there about the, uh, be, women being apprehensive about the word feminism. And, and I agree, and this is again, a, a difficult thing for, um, for me, because I want people to use the word in the right way. And I correct people every day, like, no, feminism is not about women being better than men. It's about equality. But I also get, I also get this response. It's like, oh, the word feminist sounds like women are superior. And when I have organized um, workshops and or I worked with people in more conservative settings, women have said that they prefer to use the word equality and that they can feel, they, they think they can get their fight further if, um, if they say equality. And, and so when we start uh, working with them to plan to fight certain wars, one of the first things they say is, I will not say, they say, I will not use the word feminism. And again, we need to respect that because what's more important, saying the word or fighting and winning the war. And, and so I, I, I respect that, but um, it's hard when, when the, the first fight is making sure that we don't need to wear high heels anymore in our workspace. And, and there are other fights that I'm thinking of, but the rhythm and, and the importance of each of, of these fights is very unique and very, uh, it, and very contextualized. So I, I I have to think I shifted my my way of thinking about feminism to to listening more and not try to um, categorize based on our Western categories to to judge whether people are doing it right or wrong because the more, all we can do is provide tools information and and then everyone decides or the groups decides collective uh, collective uh, decides how to go. Thank you so much, Ale. Um, and it looks like we have lots of questions yeah. and they may actually even be dissertations. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but let me look 
at some of these and come to you because there's some in yeah. one uh, in the chat and also in the Q and A. So let me just get down to the questions. All right. Hi, they're they're very good. I really like the questions. I have Anna Sophie's here. Uh, I, we can start there. We work to build transformative leadership programs for illiterate women in, in a few countries. Yeah. Yes. Um, my advice is, is to try to use, um, as of course, as little text as possible. Try to use images and pictures. We have introduced, uh, for the, the project where I'm currently working, we print out large format pictures of women doing different activities. And in these pictures, we include some of the women who are participating in the workshop. And they are very surprised that, that we have included them as an example of uh, women's uh, working, women uh, engaging in certain fights, et cetera. And, and the pictures have, have helped us to ask questions about themselves, to help them open up about their own experiences and to compare their experiences to other women's. So audiovisual visual uh, definitely helps. And of course we may not have electricity or we may not have um, all the resources. And, and this is again, something that I have come back to. We need to use very low technology. We need to not uh, imagine that we'll have perfect conditions and, and pictures printed and, and plastified is one of the, of the key things to engage in conversations and talk about, um, about rights. And I'm happy to uh, talk a lot more with you, Sophie, later because uh, we've been uh, testing and trying different things for the past 10 years or so. Thank you, Ali. And now um, I'm hoping that Constance, uh, she asked whether you're still an advocate mm -hmm. of child marriage. And I guess, I yeah. Answered yeah, that. Yes, I'm, yeah, I, 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 yes. I am uh, a profound advocate, if you will, um, but I, I think that we cannot set a, a world standard yet because that will leave many girls behind and, and the fights are going to take different shapes and forms uh, depending on the country and the community and the culture and the religion. Thank you, Ale. And from Kathmandu, how can we empower women living in remote villages who are totally unaware about the technology and busy in their household uneducated? This is Papendra, uh, who's writing from Kathmandu. I think um, I think we need to focus on 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 these women and these girls. One of the big lessons that I've learned is that the earlier we we start, the better. And the more remote the community, the more important it is to start at an age where girls can still still have some freedom to meet. Uh, usually uh, women, as you say, are very busy and are may maybe preoccupied with just feeding their children, uh, but working with their daughters uh, work goes really far. We have seen uh, women just taking up materials that their daughters use and then coming to the, back to the educators or the mentors and asking for more. And so um, in my past work, where I, when I worked for Population Council, uh, we, we did uh, baseline evaluations, very quick baseline evaluations. These are not complex by any means, but try to understand the critical age to engage girls. And um, Nepal is, it has very similarities to Guatemala. So probably age eight or nine is, is as, as young as you can start. So that by the time they are adolescents, these girls are going to be uh, we'll have more information and we'll have uh, a form of education that goes beyond what we expect of formal education. We still have this alternative education on their rights and, and the possibilities in their communities. So my first uh, advice is to start really young. Thanks, Ale. Um, so here's another question, and this is related to child marriage. Um, and it's from Marie. Uh, do you think we can do something collectively against policies to influence them by petition, advocate in some way against the practice because it's unfair and the girl child has the right to grow up as a child, not a wife? 
Yes, and, 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 and we have, I mean, I know many of our countries have passed laws regarding child marriage. And I don't know if you have had this experience, but I, I've also heard of many ways to get around the law. And that makes me really angry. But every time I, I work in a community, someone tells me, oh, we just sign the paper informally and then they will register in the civil registry when she turns 18. So the law has made people aware, but it may not be the answer in every context. And I think the public policies that do get us further are um, education and access to reproductive rights. And um, education, as I was explaining before, education about their bodies, education that includes self-esteem, education that uh, I think focuses on the fact that the girl is an entity in herself. She doesn't belong to someone. She doesn't belong to her father. She doesn't belong to her husband. And, and I have seen in different places that awareness of the body and uh, becoming um, knowledgeable of it has helped more than just learning a law or learning that it's her right to remain a child. So that fight is harder because we have many more people against reproductive rights that we have maybe about child marriage. Child marriage sounds like undesirable to many people, but the same people that will uh, help uh, help uh, pass a law about against child marriage will not pass a law uh, regarding reproductive rights. So I think that fight is probably the, the most important critical fight. Thank you so much, Ale. Um, next one uh, from Chantal. What are your thoughts on how to empower women in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, tri-border region to overcome their own circumstances of gender-based violence using a feminist approach? I, uh, I think borders are probably one of the most challenging places because of the different types of violence that happen there. And, um, and I think in these cases, the first, the first thing to do is ask them, why are they there? Because many of these women are not originally from border towns, border communities. They're there because of uh, very precarious circumstances in the place uh, where they are originally from. So uh, whether they're fleeing domestic violence or looking for work, or maybe the fact that they were trafficked. And uh, when we talk about trafficking, we need to remember that there, it also takes many shapes and forms. They may not know they were trafficked. They may just think they were, they were offered a job at a bar or a restaurant on the border, but they're, uh, they're kidnapped, they're, they're trafficked, and, and they're being held against their will. And, and, and I, I uh, admire anyone and everyone working on the border because uh, working using a feminist approach uh, means gaining many, many enemies. And so uh, this is one of the areas where I think baby steps need to be taken. And listening to women in terms of what they think is the first step to improve their situation. I don't think we can talk about solving situations right away, but coming with a realistic solutions. And I know that the pragmatic or realistic approach is something that we get criticized by feminists in countries where they don't face the same issues because they, they think we're not doing enough. But I think the context matters more than anything. So looking at the context and the context of the, of the women in, in the Trifinio, in this tri-border region, is very important. And then once you understand the segments, who is there voluntarily, who is there as a victim of traffic, who is there because she wants to go to another country, then the strategies can become more specific to, to each, women's, uh, each woman's situation. Thanks so much, Ale. And we're now going to go into your anthropological background. Um, and the question is, how do you balance or deal with anthropological slash feminist methodology? By this, I mean anthropology that mm -hmm. has largely been a discipline concerned with producing knowledge about other while feminist methodology or social justice methodology has been very critical of this method of knowledge production. 
Well, uh, I think that that view, uh, it's sort of the classic view of how anthropology ori originated. But um, anthropology has been very critical of itself since the late 1980s. And, um, and, and, and that I'm speaking about the Western, the Western world, the Northern world of anthropology. Anthropology in places like Guatemala has, because we are in the context, we, we are not outsiders that go in and out. We're very close to this quote unquote other. Uh, we have been challenged earlier than anthropologists from the North in terms of our role, our interests. And while extractivist anthropology still happens, uh, a lot of the things that we have been doing for the past 15, 20 years involve uh, the more activist part of anthropology, which has also always existed. And it is um, taking the methodologies, making them uh, a lot more horizontal and, and working to move the agendas from people's perspectives. And there's um, all the components of, of social justice in, in the applied methodologies where um, what we do is use the power that we have as scientists, the power that we have as NGO workers to take sides with, um, with women uh, in, when we're talking about working with women. And, and the, the project, I'll just give a quick example of my experience right now. Uh, working in uh, improving economic conditions for women uh, seems uh, to us very narrow-minded because engaging in economic activities many times uh, is more important for women because of the freedom that they gain of uh, leaving their house because they get access to education opportunities because they they uh, get more the, the fact that they control uh, some resources in the household gives them um, a little bit more power and say. And we cannot measure those uh, projects only in, term, in terms of income. We need to measure them from the perspective of these women. And, and that fight is a, it's a tough fight because donors like USAID still think very narrowly about what economic development, development means. But when we uh, take sides uh, with, we take the side of women and, and we use these powerful tools to uh, amplify their voices, then then uh, I don't see the contradiction between being a feminist and being an anthropologist. But I understand that's uh, sort of like the, the reputation that we have, and it's well deserved for uh, people from other generations, for sure. Great, thanks so much, Ale. Um, since there's one question in the Q&A, I wanted to ask this from Ruyapa, I believe, and she um, was very intrigued that, that you've been to India and have experience in India. I wanted to hear a little bit about your India experience. Yes, um, this, this also goes back to my work with uh, Population Council, where uh, I was part of a, a group of um, uh, researchers that were uh, doing similar uh, studies uh, regarding girls access to education opportunities and prevention of child marriage and and so I, I was able to learn a lot from from this fights uh, in in India that had to do basically with um, the poorest girls and and the more mag marginalized girls accessing education formal education completing formal education and work at community levels to prevent child marriage or to engage local leaders to um, to take the side of girls and, and, and stop child marriage. So I, I learned Bangladesh was also another, another country that, that uh, was in the same project. I didn't get a chance to go to Bangladesh, but I was able to see it in India and Ghana. And, and to compare with colleagues was very, very useful because there are definitely certain similarities, very important ones. And then there are challenges that are very different uh, from country to country. And I think the fact that um, communities in India value education, formal education, that uh, India society in general is, uh, values ed formal education, I think gives an advantage in terms of pushing the agenda forward. That was one of my big lessons. Great, thank you, Ale. Next question comes from Glennis. Um, how can we initiate critical thinking among women? Because even though women are getting more educated, involved in their communities, in their 
culture still hinders their progress and decisions on life? Uh, that, uh, this is exactly uh, uh, you, you, this is the question that we were asking yesterday with these women who were uh, child brides and then became coffee growers. Um, we still, and I still think that some of them could have left abusive households. They could have uh, gone against their culture of valuing women only when they're married. But I think critical thinking and just placing questions in the framework, does this make you happy? Does it feel right? Uh, makes women pick battles that they can move forward. And one thing that I, I um, learned and that I was, I've been told by community leaders, indigenous community leaders in Guatemala is that the timeframes are different. They will tell me, well, you want to change this in a year or two years, this is going to take a generation. And to think about that um, can be very upsetting because of course I don't want another child bride ever. And in some places the culture is going to, it's going to take one generation. And if we, if we look at it in, like in, the, in a big frame, one generation is very little if you want to change a culture that has been in place for 5,000 years or 500 years or a thousand years. It's not that much, it's just that you and I think of every girl, little girl, every adolescent, and we want to make sure she is safe, but the, the fight is going to take longer. And, and again, I think the, there's a combination between bringing our information and providing these thinking tools and then listening to women about which fights they think they can start winning. And it is important to win certain fights, even if these are small fights because the, the more they win, the bolder they will get uh, in terms of challenging, in terms of um, being a, a more of a critical mass in, in, changing, in changing the cultures where they come from. And one thing that uh, has helped us uh, talk in the culture talk is that oppression, oppression is it's not really culture. If it's around the world, and if you take oppression out of your culture, nothing, the good things are going to stay, that we're not taking away the good things about culture, we're not taking the, the values that, that protect communities, the values about land, about protecting the environment, the values around family and being supportive and, and solidarity, we're just taking away the painful parts. And, and women appreciate it when, when they realize they're not, they don't need to sacrifice the things they like about their culture, which is about making cultures more equal. Thank you, Ali. Um, so one of the participants um, wanted to know, how does one create opportunities for those women who are out there who are afraid or ashamed of calling themselves feminists in countries like Sierra Leone? How, how do they declare themselves this way in these countries that uh, where there's a general fear around the term? It's, it's the same case in Central America. Um, and, and what most women have chosen is to talk about equality and equality of opportunities. And I think it's just the word feminism has been um, charged with so much stigma that we also need to be honest about it and, and know that in some places we may not ever be able to call it feminism, but if, if equality works for these women in Sierra Leone or in Guatemala where we work or in Belize or in, in, in the Caribbean, let's use the word that keeps the values, keeps uh, the important stuff and, and just leave the word on the side for a while. I don't think feminism as a fight is going to suffer if we use another word, but women are going to suffer if we impose the word on them. Thanks so much, Ali. Um, I have another question. Child marriage is not only a problem, it's a reflection of a social construct. So it is so difficult to reduce unless society reconstructs its, um, another construct basically uh, for something to change. How does a feminist approach define social construct? Uh, how can we, we reconstruct basically? I, I totally agree. I think um, what a girl is, what a woman is and does 
is a social contract, a, a social construct that includes what she does at what age. And, and one of the, of the, I think of the more universal ways of challenging these ideas is um, through education and formal education of girls, because they, they then have the tools to engage in other activities that, um, and it sounds horrible, but this is how parents sometimes say, like showing that my daughter is useful, uh, quote unquote, is useful in other fields, demonstrating that my daughter can contribute to the household in ways other than leaving it and marrying and moving to her husband's house. And, um, and so we, as I agree, we need to substitute these gender roles that have been on like ongoing for so long with others. And, and again, this requires very contextual thinking. We need to see around us and see where are the niches that girls want to take on, where are the niches that they can occupy so that the notion that the only thing a girl can do is marry at age 14 and start reproducing and helping her, her mother-in-law start changing, changing. And I think, again, we need to think in terms of a generation. And this brings me to how we invest in these projects. I, my experience is that projects need to be in a place for 10 or 15 years. Like if we're working in regions where child marriage is a, it's a profound problem, where sexual violence is a profound problem, we cannot hope to fix it in a year or two years. That's, that has never happened uh, and, and remains sustainable. And we need to think about cultural sustainability. And cultural sustainability means that the community has changed the way they think about a certain subject in a way that makes sense in their own culture and they will therefore protect it. So once investment stops, once scholarships stop, they will sustain it because it now makes sense in their culture. And, and so when, when writing proposals, I always, try to be very honest with myself and my colleagues and say, is this something that can become culturally sustainable? Can we uh, ensure that efforts will stay on so that these women and girls who are at the forefront of the fight will not be abandoned by us after a couple of years and then left to fight for themselves when the context is not yet changed. So this requires rethinking about funding and this is, I think, one of the challenges that we as a, as a world community of feminists can think of, to really push and advocate for the way that projects are, are thought about and how projects are made sustainable. Thanks so much, Alejandra. I love your point about cultural sustainability. I think that that's something that uh, is often not in the development link lingo in terms of what sustainability is supposed to look like. It's usually sometimes, but let's look for the other donor <laughs> to come in mm -hmm. and continue yeah. the funding or will the government take it over? But mm -hmm. often it's a, it is about those communities. And as you're saying, how can those communities, what is that cultural perspective shift that takes place for the, that sustainability to become a norm? Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's great. And, and, and we, need, and we need to change at least one norm if we want to create that cultural sustainability. That's great. Great. Um, so we have a question from Tanda in Cameroon. And she mentions that um, in the African context, which is very male uh, predominant, and as you know, and uh, have you met any feminists uh, in Africa? And what, uh, if any, approaches do you think would be best for a place like Cameroon, uh, given your connections with, with people in Africa? I think I have met many feminists. They don't call themselves feminists. Uh, Africa is a place that has taught me to listen to, to how women frame their fights. And um, I, I have an example from Benin that I still think a lot about. This is a woman uh, in a faraway community who's a seamstress. And she uh, decided to take on apprentices. And these apprentices were girls that were very vulnerable that would be married off uh, to probably violent men if, if they didn't leave the house. 
So this woman took on about eight apprentice, apprentices and you would think, well, she's exploiting them, but she was not exploiting them. She was sending them to school. She was telling them, teaching them how to be seamstresses and giving them a place to live and eat. So in other words, it was a small collective of uh, this woman with eight or nine girls of different ages that had left their house and their parents had allowed it because they were apprenticing to be seamstresses. And what this woman was doing was protecting them from uh, being exposed to violence or being married off forcibly. And, and I think in, in especially in, in Africa, I've worked mostly in West Africa and uh, in Central Africa. The, the scale of the challenge is such that we also need to think of scales that are more community-based and to, uh, and to find these champions, these women who are doing incredible things, but at a scale that is so small that sometimes we miss it. And uh, because we cannot wait for a large movement to begin uh, to start making these changes. And, and again, I think the frustrating part is the time scale is that it's going to take a while, but um, they don't come, call themselves that, but they're definitely feminists. They're, they're doing the fight we're doing. Thank you so much, Alejandra. Um, someone's also interested in your experience in Ghana, a little bit about uh, East Southern around child marriage. Yes, this is the same. It was a similar project to the one in India and that we later started in Benin. And it was um, in some of the, of the shanty towns around Accra where um, mentors, uh, the program was training mentors, young women, that had a little bit more of education that had some secondary education. And they, they uh, found girls in, in these villages that would meet once a week to learn uh, from a curriculum that had been, uh, that had been designed specifically for, for the context of these uh, villages that had been incorporated into the, into the metropolitan area, if you will. And, and these programs uh, across India, Bangladesh, Guatemala, Honduras, et cetera, were similar in the sense that they were rights-based and that uh, they included tools about around empowerment, about being able to communicate with their parents, being able to uh, talk with authorities, uh, identify violence. And the key was that uh, most of them were set for a year or two years that allowed the mentors to become part of the girls' lives and help them navigate certain things. And, and I think Ghana had a component uh, that allowed girls like a stipend to continue their education. In each country, there were different formats. And, and it worked. I, I, I'm a true believer in, in, in cascade education, in peer education, uh, but not peer in the sense that it's the same age, but someone slightly older, someone who has become successful uh, in the eyes of the community, a girl that has gone through more education than the rest, a girl that has a job, a girl that has managed to start her own business, works a lot better than bringing someone from outside that has little, uh, it's not a reference in the community. Thank you so much, Ale. Um, someone was uh, asking about Zambian, her experience with child marriage due to poverty mm -hmm. and parents seeing child marriage as a way out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Do you have any strategies to share with this participant on your experience? I think I, I would say many of the child marriage cases are poverty driven. And, and this is where, again, it, it, our work is not easy, that's, that's for sure. If it's easy, it's because you're working with a group that has already sorted out many things. I, I think in, in poverty, that your, your question about poverty goes back to one of the initial examples that I gave this community where girls were married off at 14 and where success meant that they were married off at 16 when they could uh, negotiate better with their husbands. They had some say in who they married. And like I said, this is not the ideal that we have, but uh, we need to listen to, to girls' empowerment needs. And I think in terms of poverty, programs need to come with a subsidy. And that's something that it's hard to negotiate with governments. Subsidies so that we're basically buying girls time, buying girls time to stay in school, buying girls time to, to learn a trade or to, 
or to engage in different activities while culture changes. And, and once more, investments are necessary. I don't think in places that are um, ravaged by poverty that parents will make this decision unless they, they can address the poverty part, at least partially. Thank you so much, Holly. And I love this whole notion of um, the need to really value girls' time, the need to value what that is, uh, that it's oftentimes uh, a choice on around resources and that that's not a, you know, because you create a program, they should show up. It's, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it's mm -hmm. not an, um, a given. Um, so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, um, and, just, and, and, and oh. again, I, I just want to say this is one of the uncomfortable points because the politically correct way of saying is, oh, we'll create a program and they should come. <laughs> and, and the politically incorrect way is saying, we need to demonstrate to parents that, that they will come and learn something useful. So programs, for example, that include handcrafts or learning how to make certain things uh, attract parents more and, and, and we need to be smart about it. And while we're knitting or sewing, we talk about rights, we talk about sexual and reproductive health, et cetera. The, the idea is to offer a trade-off that it's acceptable in the in the context of poverty in communities. It's not even cultural in the sense, I think it's in terms of poverty. What makes sense to parents and then buy this time, like demonstrate that the time is valuable. Great, thank you so much, Ale. And I see a lot of comments just um, really, really uh, appreciative of your uh, points and on cultural sustainability around the child marriage context um, and the Im importance of all of what you're saying. I think there's um, there's one person from Nigeria who is also asking if there's any, um, any uh, that he sees the similarities, he or she sees some similarities with the work that you've been doing and wonders if there's any suggestions you have around that as well. I think uh, we need to validate our programs. We need to validate uh, the methodologies that we use. Uh, it's very important to listen to girls that have gone through programs and learn from them what works and what doesn't work. And, and work, the more, more girls that get involved in this, the more adolescents that participate in programs, the better we'll know how to reach them. And, and I think that, um, as adults, we need to take a step back. And now that we have provided certain tools, uh, encourage them to be critical, encourage them to bring uh, recommendations, to ask for more. And, and I think once, uh, once the tools, the basic tools are given, then we need to help them raise the resources to continue uh, achieving this cultural sustainability. And one example that I have is uh, from one of the areas in Guatemala where we work, uh, on rights, the basic curriculum on, on rights, education and, and, and empowerment, learning about their body, they decided that they wanted to focus their effort on fighting for water rights territory and uh, resist um, changes, land tenure changes. And so they became uh, environmentalists on their own at their own scale. And, and our fundraising shifted to help them fundraise enough to start their their, pro their project on sustainable agriculture. And this sustainable agriculture is still very feminist, <laughs> but uh, it revolves around uh, remembering or claiming back traditional uh, agricultural practices so that women can feed themselves and their families. So um, if you have invested for a while on girls, like it's time to sit down and ask them, what next? Like what's the fight you want to take on and how can we help? It's great, Ali. I know that um, you and I share this perspective on starting with what is it that they already do? What is it that they already have? What is it that they're it's already on their radar as girls and young women in a lot of communities? And 
not how you know how do we solve your problems and um and i think that's uh something i really value about your work mm -hmm. um is that starting point um so i i don't see any other questions now uh but i just wanted to ask uh, one last question um in terms of the future of your work? Where do you see it going? Where, where are the key things that you see as critical for you to be working on as a, as a feminist in Central America? My, my step, that where I am right now is um, yeah. literally going around visiting uh, projects and, and places where I have worked in the past and talking with feminists, like the young feminists that are, again, may, they may not be calling themselves feminists, but they're doing the fight and uh, sitting down with them, listening to what they hope to do, helping them uh, with practical things like how do you fundraise? How do you write a proposal? Uh, making a budget, if they're starting say community tourism, help them, help them in the technical aspects where they tell me they need help and then um, create a baseline, uh, help them remember how to evaluate their impact on women. Are they really helping women or making them more vulnerable? and then just let go. So I'm, I'm trying to use my time in like in the service of this of these groups that have been working for a while and and hoping that they will work with the next generation. Like I said, um, I'm, I'm a very uh, I'm a very impatient person. So thinking about in terms of generational terms has been hard in my life. But I now that I go back and I visit places not not necessarily where I have worked, but where I think where I know other people have been working. And you see these steps uh, mo moving forward. I think that's where inspiration is for all of us. And, um, and I hope all of you find inspiration in those small battles because that's what's going to keep us going. Thank you so much, Alejandra. And I really wanna say thank you for your thoughtful um, responses and your ideas and suggestions to people who have been on this on this webinar and, and this dialogue. I think it's been really great to, um, to, to have that with you and to interact in this way and to have everyone join us for this and to hear about your experience, your worldly experience, not just in Guatemala, and, and but all over as you've shared. And I really want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us today for your great questions, insights, uh, for interacting with, uh, with Ale and myself. And, um, and please stay tuned. We'll have other sessions in the future with other uh, leaders as well. And um, no one like uh, Alejandra, but uh, <laughs> uh, future ones from all over as well. So thank you so much, Ali. Thank you so much. It's been great. The, 